All right, hi there. <laughs> Welcome to our YouTube channel. And today we have an interesting topic. We're talking about polygamy. What does the Bible have to say about polygamy? All right, before we go on, again, I want to remind you, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please make sure you subscribe. This, has some, this helps us to keep tab of who and who is following us and how people are getting blessed. So it will do us a lot of help if you subscribe, if you engage with the post, maybe write comments, write questions, um, share and the like and things like that. It just helps us um, to know that you're out there and it helps the video to also move faster. So please engage with the post and subscribe. Now we have some other affiliate pages that will be a blessing to you. We have um, our relationship page also titled LDM with PK. All right, please go subscribe to that also. There are different things that show on that channel. Then we have our wholesome sexuality channel. We bring you wholesome content sexually based for both male, female, for single and married. So hey, subscribe to that channel. Also wholesome sexuality because there was so, so much negative and vulgar material sexually. We just felt Christians in it where they could hear wholesome stuff sexually. So please go subscribe to that channel. Also, then if you have not subscribed to my wife's channel, Mildred Kings Lil Conquer, you will be blessed. Please go subscribe to that also. All right. And hey, and if you want to be a trained counselor, you want to be a relationship coach, we also train. All right. We've trained hundreds of people. So if you want to join, please Check the details, visit our website. The links are here, the numbers are here. Contact us. You'll be trained as a trained counselor, as a relationship coach, and if it is a recovery specialist and other trainings that we offer. If you also need counseling, details are here. Please get in touch with us. Our trained counselors will be glad to guide you and talk with you. So polygamy. What does the Bible have to say about polygamy? Is God in support of polygamy? <laughs> so um, the first thing to realize is that um, human beings are flawed. As human beings, we are flawed. This is why we need salvation. This is why we need Jesus Christ. On our own, without Christ, we are all flawed. From the day Adam fell into sin, all of us became flawed people. Our thinking became flawed or even warped, you know, the way we see things. So it is that love of Christ. It is that nature of Christ in us that is the hope of this world. All right. So this issue of polygamy um, is one of those things coming from that flawed way of thinking. Okay, so let me look at first the, some of the natural reasons people think poly polygamy is good. Some of the natural reasons. One, um, one is that there are more women than men in the world. That there are more women than men in the world. Um, so they're saying, hey, because the population of women are more than that of men, um, there's no other option than for men to marry more than one wife. Um, that is not a bad argument, interestingly. It's just that the reason, now first of all, the statistics today shows that the difference in men and women population is not so much, all right? It's not so much. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, just marrying more wives won't solve the problem. Uh, because if you look at it, what if we have more men than we have women? Are we going to say that women should marry more men? Are we also going to say that? So you see that it's a bit one-sided. It is men pushing that agenda. That, oh, there are more women, so let's marry more women. And it has always been men's nature to push for that. Men, has, men have always wanted more than one woman. All right. Most men have that polygamous streak in them. It takes the nature of God to help a man stay with one wife. You know, you know so um, the men pushing that, oh, the women are more in population. So what if men were more in population? Are these same men going to push for women to have more than one husband? You'll find out that they will never push it. They will say everybody should be content where they are. So it's not, a, it's not an objective um, look at it. All right, but the statistics today shows that the difference in men and women in population is not so much. It's not so much. It's, they are literally both around forty something percent. So they are around the same area. That's what the statistics um, today shows. All right. So we have more women in 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 the, in the world doesn't mean that polygamy is is a good idea. Now in the Bible days, the reason why it seemed you know, and I mean in Bible days, I don't mean that. Um, the Bible supports it. I just mean in the times, in their own times, um, women were not allowed to work. Women did not usually do business and things like that. So women were really vulnerable. If their fathers were no more and they didn't have husbands, women were really vulnerable because they were not working, they were endangered, people were taking them as slaves and things like that. So polygamy was really, really a way they, they devised to help people. But the truth is that in this day and age, um, there are a lot of single women thriving. Nobody's going to kidnap them or enslave them. So those days are fast. So that, again, is not a strong excuse for today. 
for polygamy for today. Okay, that's why they did it then. I'm not saying it's good or bad then, but that was what their, their logic at that time. Okay, second common reason here is that um, one woman usually can meet the needs of a man. I'm dealing with the natural reasons first before I go into the Bible, okay? So they're saying, oh, one woman cannot naturally meet the desire or the need of a man. And that is absolutely true again, all right? That also seems like a good point if you look at it. Um, usually one, a woman's um, sexual passion, usually, okay? And I know there are exceptions, but usually a man's sexual passion is way higher than that of a woman's own. Men have what they call testosterone, so this makes them more sexually aggressive so and have more sexual passion. So a man's sexual ability and capacity is higher than that of a woman. So a man really can have sex with many, many, many women in a day, you know, and be okay with it. So, uh, and as a woman begins to grow, there are a lot of things going through her body and mind psychologically and physiologically and all that. So she's, um, for instance, has periods. Women have periods every, every month. Men don't have periods. Um, at this time, when women have periods, it's at that time, after the period that they have ovulation, that is their time of highest sexual need. It's just like a two, three day period. After that, they are just normal. But a man can be on his high peak sexually 30 days a, 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 a month. All right. So all these factors. A woman can get pregnant. When she's pregnant, she might not be as sexually active. Now, you can have sex during pregnancy, but she might not be as sexually active. Some women are totally not in the mood. Uh, different things, you know. When a woman is getting older, of course, her sexual passion is also dropping. A man at 70 can still be having children, you know. So they have a point, all right. Uh, but the truth is that more women will necessarily not satisfy, all right? Contentment is what God wants us to have, contentment. Having more women will not satisfy you, all right? Contentment, having, you know, um, saying that one man, one woman can meet a man's sexual need is the same thing as saying one man can meet all of a woman's emotional need. So should that woman now go and have more husbands? No, she will make do with her husband. Because one man can't meet a woman's emotion. A woman is too versatile. A woman, you know, what she's going through emotionally, you know, most times a man, one man can't meet all her emotional needs. The man that is out there hustling to get money can't also give her all the emotional attention she needs, can't give her all the conversation she needs, can't give her all those things. You know, so she, 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 if you left the woman, she will also need like three, four men to meet. And in fact, so many demand that will meet all her financial needs. All women like to have a husband that's like a sugar daddy, that doesn't complain, but that drops a lot of money. How many men can meet all of a woman's financial needs? Just very few that are rich, that are rich. Most of the men are just upcoming. They can't reach. A woman needs, if a woman is happy, she shops. If she's not happy, she shops. If she doesn't know how she feels, she shops. Shopping solves all her needs. So how many men can afford that? You know, so things like that. So just because one person can meet all your needs, it's not an excuse to have many people because you will still not be satisfied. Those men that have more than one wife still cheat on those people, still look for more women outside because it's more a character issue than a satisfaction issue. The Bible said godliness with contentment is great gain. So we need to be content. More women will not satisfy. Ask King Solomon, King Solomon David. He had 1,000 women in his life and he wasn't satisfied. At the end of his life, he said, vanity of vanity, all his vanity died. His soul was still empty. After 1,000 women, can you even phantom what it's like to have 1,000 women in your life? And it's not in the digital age. It means you were dating and marrying these women manually. You were seeing, where will you even accommodate them? Which accommodation? Then if you accommodate them, how often can you see them? If you see three in a day, if you spend time with three in a day, this, you have other work. Your work is not sleeping with them. You have other work. You do three in a day. If you do three in a day, in a year, you still haven't seen all of them. There are 365 days in a year. So you, some people will be looking at for two years' time. So after you see Jane today, you say, Jane, your next appointment is in year 2026. <laughs> That's how it will be. You know, imagine that. And there are a lot of men that tried it. There are a lot of men that have had many wives. It never turns out well. All right. It's a big distraction. Solomon got almost mad by the end of his life, drawn away from God. So just because you, one woman can't meet all your needs or one man can't meet all your needs, it's not an excuse to have many more. All right. Number three. It's another common one is that, hey, my wife um, hasn't given birth or is not giving birth to male children. My wife has only female daughters, so I need a woman that will give birth to male children. Um, that's such an incredibly, um, I don't want to say dumb thing to say, but <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word, that's an incredibly dumb thing to say. 
um, you know, it is the men that determine the sex of the child. Scientifically, you know, people should be enlightened. It is the man that determines the sex of the child. All right. So having more wives is not going to make you have male children if you were not going to have male children. All right. And anytime you see somebody have more wives and eventually has a male child, it's purely a matter of chance. It's not because of that woman. It's the man that determines the sex of the child. It's science. It's common science. You see, when they say you should attend a science class, you didn't attend. You went to a business admin. You see why you don't know what we are saying? <laughs> you went to find out. Okay, I'm joking. I'm joking. But the point is that, <laughs> the point is that um, it's the man that determines the sex of the child. So um, if the man is, has a wife and has seven daughters, Having a new wife is not the solution, all right? Very, very important. And you have made a commitment, a vow to this woman. It's important you're able to stay with it, okay? You don't just jump at the slightest um, challenge, okay? And the last excuse, and this way it brings us to the Bible, is that even God approves polygamy. So this is where I really come in, because we're going to go to the Bible now. That God approves polygamy. And I've heard all kinds of people even people that are supposed to be or claim to be pastors or claim to be reading the Bible or spiritual, saying that God is, 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 is interested in, in polygamy, that God approves it. That's, that's, an, that's, that's just a lie. All right? That's just a lie. And in interpreting scripture, I've always tried to say this, there are rules to interpreting scripture. You can't just interpret scripture the way you like. It doesn't work like that. There are rules to interpreting scripture because it's a coded book. All right, there are rules to interpret scripture. If you're going to interpret scripture, interpret scripture, you must check the text, the context. You must read before, after the verse you're trying to interpret. You must follow the same pattern of interpretation for all the verses. You can't interpret one way this way and interpret the next verse the other way. It doesn't work that way. All right. Um, you must also check the nature of who is speaking, the structure of who is speaking, and the culture of the people at the time at which they are speaking. All right. Follow what I'm saying. You must check the nature of who is speaking, that is God. You must check the structure of what is being spoken about, which is marriage, and you must check the culture of the people. Because what people said is that, oh, but in the Bi in, in Old Testament times, almost all the fathers of the faith and the people in the Bible had more than one wife um, from Abraham. Uh, you know, Abraham eventually married um, um, Hagar. You know, um, you see the verse there because some people don't know Abraham married Hagar, he did. You know, that Abraham, Abraham had had one of one wife, um, um, Jacob, um, you know, a lot of them had more than one wife. A lot of the Bible heroes had more than one wife. David had more than one wife. Solomon, we can't even talk about Solomon, all right? <laughs> He's the Baba of them all. You know, so most of them had more than one wife. So people take this to mean that God approves polygamy. That's what they're telling me. And that is not true. I say you must check the nature, the structure, and the culture of the time. So what is the nature? The nature of God is clear. God is not unfair. If you check from Genesis, when God talked about marriage, he said, the two shall become one flesh. The two. He made them male and female. That answers the gay question. He made them male and female. And he also made the two to become one. The questions are answered there in Genesis when God introduced marriage. The two shall become one flesh. It's a covenant between two people. Two shall become one flesh. It can't be three shall become one flesh. It's two. Um, 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 God could have brought three women for Adam to marry at the same time if he supported polygamy. God has never, his nature shows that he, and the concept of polygamy makes women feel like they are items. So a man can have many of it. You will never hear anybody push that women should have many husbands. That's called polyandry also. You will never hear anybody push that. You, what you always hear is that men should marry many wives. They are seeing women as items. God, that's not God's nature at all. And whenever you see anything that looks in scripture like God is, like they are saying God is trying to say he supports polygamy, interpret well. If you know the nature of God, you know it's not so. God can never support polygamy. Scripture never contradicts itself. I always say that. Scripture never contradicts. If you read well, you will see where the interpretation is. As an issue. It's never scripture that inter contradicts itself. So, like I said, look at the nature, the structure, and the culture. Nature of God is that there's no difference between male and female, Jew or Greek. So God doesn't see women as inferior to men. God never sees that. And it's unfair for women to be treated like objects that we can have many of. Like you're buying horses. You know, you're buying cattle. You can buy many. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Women are not inferior to men. Anywhere you see that happening, it's not God that pushed it. It is the culture of the time that pushed it. If you check it, most places where polygamy is pushed, like in the Bible days, it was the culture of the time. It had nothing to do with God. It was the culture of the time. It's like slavery. There was slavery too as part of their culture then. If you notice, God didn't just come and abolish it. That's not how God operates. God will work with you where you are 
and get you to where he wants you to be. But he's not going to just change you overnight. Nobody does that. Your culture won't change. All right? God is not necessarily always against culture. Only when the culture is contrary to scripture, then God is against it. But ordinary culture of the way you want to dress, the way you want to dance, God has no problem with it. So the culture of the time, the nature of God is that there's no difference between Jew and Greek, male or female. Women are not inferior to men anywhere in scripture. You see it in 1 Peter 3, he said, treat your wife um, with understanding because she fellow, she joined hair with you to the blessings of God or to the inheritance of God. So God doesn't see women as inferior. Very important. All right. And when I was coining out this, pro, this um, program, I wanted to write the title. I wanted the title to be that I recommend polygamy or I believe in polygamy. Now, I wanted to use such a catchy title, then I will not balance what I'm saying in the video. You know, so if you, if you know people that know me, if you see me right, I believe in polygamy. If you know me enough, you know that that can't be what I'm saying. You know it's just a quote or a title I'm trying to build on. So if you know my nature, you know that's not what I'm saying. So the same way, if you know God, you know that God can never support polygamy. If you know his nature. It's like those of us that are Africans, if, it, if your mother sends to go and bring food, from the kitchen, and you bring the food, and you are standing with the food here, and you're looking at her, she's looking at you, she'll say, put it on my head now. You will know that she doesn't mean literally put the food on my head. If you understand her nature, you will know she's just being sarcastic. She doesn't mean that. So when you understand the nature of God, you know that polygamy is not something God supports. That's number one. Number two, the structure of marriage. Two shall become one. If you understand that, that marriage is a covenant, and that God everywhere, Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, everybody's made it clear, two shall become one, you know that. Um, God can support it. Then the culture of men, that's where polygamy has been. So if you see Abraham and Jacob, those things, they were dealing with the situation of their time. That was their own culture. It had nothing to do with God. Solomon marrying um, 1,000 women is not God. Even you watching me, if you're a Christian, God is working with you the way where you are. He's not going to kill you because you're stepping out of line. So if they write your story now, there's some part of your story that it was you that did it. But because God is faithful, he's trying to still work with you. It will look like God supported you. God didn't support you. If God didn't support that act, you learn what God supports by his scripture. And it's clear. Polygamy is not his thing. Okay? So let's look at a few scriptures, common scriptures that um, uh, people use. Okay? I've established that in Bible times, in those days, it was their culture to marry more than one wife. It was something that they were doing, not God. Um, the Middle Eastern people had a lot. But till today, you know, they still have the culture. In fact, in most of those cultures, women were like second-rate citizens. That's how it was. It was, it was man-made, not God. Slavery is man-made, not God. All these things are man-made, all right? Human beings were like that. I told you human beings are flawed. So men generally treated women as second-class citizens. In those, some of those mid, 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 Middle Eastern um, countries, it's still like that. You know, in some countries like Saudi Arabia, um, you know, women just started driving recently. Women didn't used to drive. They were not allowed to drive. Some countries, women are allowed to go out alone. Some countries, women are not allowed to expose them. They must cover themselves in their hijab or whatever. They do. Totally covered. They can't. So this is just culture. It has nothing to do with God. It's not, it's not, or let me say it's not Bible. Okay? It's what's going on in the community where the people are. Okay? Um, some of those countries, you can't travel out without your husband's consent. You can't drive a car. This is even till last year, 2022, 2021. Uh, women couldn't drive in some of these countries. So for me, for somebody to now write the story and say, oh, God, is that was the, the, what the Bible, no, no, had nothing to do with God. It's not everything in the Bible that is the word of God. Some part of the Bible is just a history of the lives of men. I hope this is making sense. Okay, so let's go into it a bit now. Some of the common scriptures that people used to defend that God is in support of polygamy. So let's read the most common one. Um, in the old, we read one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. One of the common ones people said was where um, the prophet came to meet, um, you know, the prophet came to meet David. Um, David had just um, slept with Bathsheba, got a child, killed Bathsheba's husband, blah, blah, blah. So the prophet came to warn him, and, uh, peop and people now said, oh, the Bible says that God said that he gave David many wives. So let's read it. So Nathan was telling David, and I, the word from God, God was saying, basically, and I gave thee thy master's house, this is 2 Samuel 12, 8. I give thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and give thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. So people began to quote this to say, God was saying, if you wanted more wives, I will give you more wives. That's not what God said. All right, so let's read again. God said, I give unto you your master's house and your master's wives 
and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that was too small, I would give you more things. I would try to bless you more. Now, God wasn't saying, I will give you more wives, first of all. Secondly, what they were saying here was a chain of statement. You can't pick one line out of context. No, read the whole thing. God was telling David, look, I gave you your master's house. So in those days, in Bible days, whenever you went for war and you won a kingdom, everything that kingdom belongs to you. And if the king wins this king, this king's household comes under this other king. So royalty takes over royalty, army takes over army, police takes over police. I don't know if you understand. So if Nigeria outruns on that country now, all their soldiers are not going to be sent to the farm. These are soldiers. They're going to be recruited into our army. Their police will be recruited into our police. The royal family there will move into our, the royal family here. They're still going to be royalty, just that they're under now another royalty. That's how it works in those Bible days. You inherit everything. You inherit everything. So what God was saying there was, I gave you your master's house. And in, your, in the master's house, guess who and who lives in the master's house? The master's family. So even the master's goats was part of this thing, but they didn't have to list everything for you. And when they say he gave him the master's wives, it doesn't literally mean that God gave him all the wives of Saul to come and marry them. No. He said they are now under your command. That's what they were saying. If you notice, they mentioned house of Judah, house of this. He said the whole thing is now under your command. So it's not that I gave you their wives individually. So there's nowhere in scripture that was mentioned where David married any of Saul's wives. None. None. So it was just a metaphor, just an, a description. Not that they're marrying the wives literally. Now, another thing. Remember that David was also married to Saul's daughter. Don't forget that David was married to Saul's daughter, Michal. So if he really took Saul's wives literally, what would have happened? That means he would have married both the daughter and now married the mother. And that's an abomination in Israel. That even doesn't make any common sense. <laughs> so you see how people are interpreting scripture. To mean, oh, he gave him wife. he can't give him his wives. In fact, in, in, in um, Deuteronomy 17, 17, the Bible is clear on God's stand. They said, when you're going to get a king, make sure this king doesn't amass to himself many wives. I don't know if I have it. Let me check it. Yes, Deuteronomy 17, 17. So let's see God's mind. You see, scripture never contradicts itself. God can't be telling David, I give him many wives. Meanwhile, here in Deuteronomy 17, 17, God is saying them, neither shall he, talking about their kings, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So this is God's mind. So don't multiply wives to yourself. The same God can't go and say he's giving you many wives. No. It was just a description that all of Saul's property, all of Saul's family are now under your care. So he doesn't have to marry them. They, are, they were queens. They, have, they can't be sent. They, 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 they don't have work. They can't work. They are queens. So they're going to live in the palace still, but now under a new kingdom. I don't know if this makes sense to you. So that's what they meant there. It was just a metaphor. That I've given you your fa your Saul's house. I've given you Saul's uh, family. I've given you Saul's property. Everything is now under your care. That's what they were saying, okay? Not that it's going to marry Saul's wives literally. No. It's not marrying Saul's wife because he's even married, already married to Saul's daughter. If he's marrying Saul's wife, it means he's marrying daughter, marrying uh, wife, mother. <laughs> and David's a bad guy, but he's not that bad. Uh, I know David's a bad dude, but he's not that bad. All right? <laughs> All right, so um, that's one scripture. So that's how that is interpreted wrongly. Next scripture is in the New Testament, where some people now come and say, this one is, so, is the funniest to me. People say, okay, but the New Testament, the Bible says only the bishop should be husband of one wife. The members are free to have 13 wives. <laughs> Again, wrong context of interpretation. So let's read it. First Timothy chapter 3. Um, it said, therefore... An overseer must be above reproach. All right? The husband of one wife. So in the verse for that, the overseer means a bishop or a pastor. Therefore, the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife. Sober-minded and all that, self-controlled, etc. So what this will now interpret to me was that, hey, they say the bishop should be husband of one wife. This means only the man of God should be husband of one wife. The rest can be um, marry anybody. Um, that's not what they're saying. If it means this, this what it means is that every bishop was first a member now. Nobody's born an overseer. You must first be a member of a church before you grow into becoming a pastor. So at what point, if, if he has if he was a member and he has already gotten 13 wife, how is he going to ever become a bishop? <laughs> it won't happen. And if it was so, it means all members will be dodging ordination. 
all the men that want to marry 13 wives. I want to tell you, you'll be dodging, dodging the oil. I want to marry 13 wives. No, that's not what they're saying at all. The, the purpose of ordaining the bishop only that has, um, if you're going to ordain the bishop, let the person have one wife. The purpose is simple, is to lay an example. What was happening in those days was that churches were new. They were entering new communities, preaching the gospel. Those communities already had their own culture. Many of those old cultures had a culture of polygamy. It was nothing about God, just their own way. They had culture of polygamy, had culture of slavery. These were things going on in life. It had nothing to do with God or God's will. It had nothing to do with God's will. So, um, they had cultures of polygamy, and Christianity was now coming into those cities. It's like the way Christianity came to Nigeria. Before that time, people had idol worship, people had many wives. People had, you're not going to change those people overnight. But the gospel will grow over time. So, he said, you know what? If you get to those communities, you start churches, if you're going to ordain pastors amongst them, don't ordain the ones that have many wives. Why? Very simple. Because we want to ordain the ones that are the example. If you ordain the one that has one wife, every other person will start to learn this is the standard. If you ordain the one that has 13 wives, guess what's going to happen? As people join the church, they will think it's okay. If our bishop has 13 wives, then it's, everybody's going to copy what they are seeing their leaders do. It's probably in a church setting. So God said, you know what? Put the right people as the example so that people copy. The purpose of example is to copy, not to go the opposite way. So what those people are trying to tell us or interpret to us is that the bishop should have one wife, members should have 13 wives. They're trying to say, bishops can go one way, members go a different way. No. As goes the pastor, so should the members go. The members are supposed to copy the pastor, not to go opposite of the pastor. So it's not a license for the members to do something different. It's an encouragement for the members to do the same thing that the pastor is doing. All right? The whole purpose of being a pastor is to give example, not to give the wrong direction. I don't know if this is making sense. So, so if we want to interpret it the way those people said it's being interpreted, what they are trying to say is that the, the pastor can go this way, members go this way. So, so let's read it in their own way now. So the overseer must be, husband, must be above reproach. This means members can be under reproach. The, the overseer must be husband of one wife. Members have 13 wives. The overseer must have self-control. Members, no self-control. Uh, the overseer must be respectable. Members, disrespect yourself. The overseer must be hospitable. Members, don't be hospitable. The overseer must not be a drunkard. If you follow the line of interpretation, it means members should be drunkards. All right? If the overseer should be one that manages his home well, it means members should not manage their home well. So if you follow what they are interpreting, the overseer should not be a lover of money. It means members be lovers of money and greedy. So the overseer should not be quarrelsome. Members be quarrelsome. The overseer should be gentle. Members don't be gentle. That's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say that the overseer goes this way, members go opposite. No. As the overseer goes, this is what is expected of all the members. The purpose of example is for everybody to copy it, not for them not to copy it. So if they say the bishop is meant to be husband of one wife, it's because he's supposed to be the example to all the other men in the house. All right? Very simple. So their point <laughs> is not that. It's totally wrong. All right? Um, the purpose of this example is for all of us to follow. Very, very important. So, all right? So um, there's no way God is in support of polygamy at all. God is never in support of polygamy. There's no scriptural grounds, all right, to support that. Everywhere is clear. Two shall become one flesh. All right? Very, very important. So, hope this has blessed you. Um, again, send us questions. Send us your points. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, follow, share to somebody that will love this. And um, uh, follow our other channels. If you want to be a counselor, trained relationship um, a consultant, please reach us. We do trainings that can be a blessing to you. If you need counseling also, our contacts are there. Please reach us. We'll be glad to be a blessing to you. All right. So God bless you. See you in the next video.